The Witcher is a Polish-American action fantasy drama television series created by Lauren Schmidt Hisrick, based on the book series of the same name by writer Andrzej Sapkowski. It stars British actor Henry Cavill as Geralt of Rivia. The costumes are by London-based costume designer Tim Aslam. Shadow and Bone is an American fantasy television series by Eric Heiserer, based on the Grisha trilogy and the Six of Crows duology, both written by Lee Bardugo. The costumes are by Calgary-based costume designer Wendy Partridge. Both shows were developed for the streaming service Netflix. This is going to be a tough challenge because the costume designs for both shows are really solid. But who did it better? Let's find out. But before we do, warning, there are mild spoilers for seasons one of The Witcher and Shadow and Bone. Now, since I haven't read the source material for either show, this analysis is based upon the shows only. To determine who did it better, the costumes in both shows will be judged on the following criteria. The design, or how well the designer interpreted the text and told the story of the characters through the costume. The execution of the costumes, taking them from the design and into items that actors wear. And finally, the wow factor, that little bit of awesome that takes a good design and makes it great. Let's begin with the design, the first step in the process before the costumes are made. This stage often involves early concept designs, mood boards, and costume renderings with fabric swatches. First up is The Witcher. With a rich tapestry of textures, a combination of metallics, blacks and jewel tones, and some clever fabric manipulations, the costumes of the first season of The Witcher are a feast for the eyes. Many of you will know Tim Aslan's work as costume designer on three seasons of the Star's original series, Black Sails. Recently, when I was working on the A Knight's Tale video, I was pleasantly surprised to learn that Aslan was part of the wardrobe team. To begin the design process, Aslan said, I started with in-depth discussions with Lauren Hisrick about the kind of look and feel she wanted for the show. He created a costume Bible with a collection of images from many eras, adding in other elements to finish the costume. He said, I did not want them to resemble medieval costumes well known from various series. It meant connecting different, seemingly mismatched elements. Aslam said, I came up with the concept, which was a mix of contemporary high fashion with Gothic influences from all the periods where Gothic research in fashion history, notably the 1890s and 1930s, plus a lot of ethnic world costume. He said, due to the sheer amount of work and incredibly short prep time for a new series, I did concept drawings for every character and crowd look beforehand for approval. Most of the actors hadn't even been cast when I initially did the designs for their respective looks for the show. The color palette for the design came from the books and script. Aslam said, Tissaia had a predetermined color palette. I tried to pump up the color as much as possible, especially as once through breakdown and with the use of filters which darkened and desaturated the color, about 40% is lost in some scenes. Jaskier's costumes and colors were an updated, let's say contemporary, high fashion version of a medieval bard. He was described in the script for episode two when we first see him as wearing a faded Witcher World equivalent to a Dolce and Gabbana outfit. In the books, Yennefer wears only black, white, and gray clothes because the colorlessness of the clothes reinforces her strengths and abilities. Therefore, the biggest challenge I had in designing Yennefer's costumes was to design different and interesting looking clothes with such a limited color palette. Aslam said, Sintra was to be rich ethereal colors, golds, bronzes, silvers, and jewel colors. Drawing on the Polish origins of the Witcher Saga book series, Aslam said a lot of the background in Sintra were based on medieval Slavic robes, as well as the look of the crowd and principal, such as Zola and Jurga and the Sodden people. Siri is in one costume for the majority of the show. Aslam said, Siri begins her journey as a princess, in fact, the future leader of the territory itself. 
her first costume position, Siri, as a fashionable and noble young lady, the leader of the future. But then she has to escape and cannot change her clothes. And if you want to know more about the Witcher costume design, I do a deeper dive into the costumes in two other videos. I'll leave a link for those in the pinned comment. With its vibrant pops of color and loads of texture, Shadow and Bone brings to the small screen some eye candy. And there's Ben Barnes. Costume designer Wendy Partridge is a film industry veteran and has worked on some very large productions, including the opening and closing ceremonies of the 1988 Calgary Olympics, where her team made 6,000 costumes, giving her the confidence to tackle Shadow and Bone. You will likely know her work in the Underworld franchise, Thor, The Dark World, Hellboy, and Pompeii, starring Kit Harington. Partridge is likely comfortable costuming in the superhero fantasy horror genre space, although she told The Wrap, I don't have a preference of what I like to work with. I think my only criteria for designing is something where I can build, so I try to avoid contemporary shows because my forte is building and designing from scratch. That's where my love and talents lie. I'm not great at going to the mall. Partridge wasn't familiar with Bardugo's book series when she was hired for the job. She said, but once I had that position, I made a point of reading all of Lee's books to get a real sense of her, how she was seeing the world that she was creating. There are so many different ethnic groups in the show, and just how she was developing this whole world within her shadow and bone genre, and it was just such an exciting show to be designing. While it's a fantasy setting, there are some real-world influences. The uniforms and weapons of the First Army, for instance, draw heavily from the Tsarist Russian Army in World War I, while the look of the Second Army is similar to the Soviet Army. Partridge said, The main body of the show has an 1870s Russian-Prussian influence, but we didn't want to make it a period show. The warring factions in the show are of Asian, Nordic, Celtic, and Black America kind of feeling. It means the clothing can be really interesting and all of the other accoutrements can be diverse. It's quite a fine envelope that you squeeze into and it's nice to be able to stretch that envelope and manipulate it out into more facets. Partridge told The Wrap, It had the flavor of a period show, the flavor of Russia. It was, of course, augmented with our set design and hair makeup and everything else. It was a full team effort. But Shadow and Bone definitely has its own look. It's not something that we'd really see before. Partridge said, and because it kind of takes place in the 1870s, looking up embroideries at the time to see what they look like, everything was very curly, very soft. Everything came around and in circles. It just felt like it was very happy. I didn't want that to be the style for the keftas because these were military uniforms. They were depicting specific talents. This wasn't a frivolous ornamentation. Both shows have marvelous costumes, but Shadow and Bone had so many characters crammed into eight episodes and dressed in so many different outfits. I found that the design at times was overly complicated. Yes, it came directly from the source material, but as I have said many times, the show has to stand on its own merits. In The Witcher, on the other hand, the costumes helped in the telling of the story, and despite the multiple timelines, I was never confused about the characters. Therefore, the winner for design is The Witcher. Next, let's look at the execution of the design, the stage that takes us from the sketch pad to the screen. This process often happens after the approval of the design, the designer working with the cutters, builders, the cast, and other technicians to bring about their ultimate vision. Kala's costumes were made for the Witcher, and many elements had to be created from scratch. The wardrobe team sewed about 250 costumes in total. The principal cast had about 7 to 10 costumes each, while the minor cast had about 140 to 150 costumes in total, in addition to the background costumes. A team of about 130 wardrobe staff also had to create multiples for stunt doubles. With a tailoring background, Aslam said, often the outfit was also influenced by the decoration. I also used various techniques of material handling, example those used in the 1930s. 
Like Shadow and Bone, which is also shot in Budapest, Hungary, Aslam had to plan for designing remotely, even before he knew what the final design might entail. So for this reason, the wardrobe buyers made all of their fabric purchases in the UK and Europe in advance. Aslam has said that he likes working with high-end upholstery fabrics, saying that they have more interesting avant-garde touches than regular silk, cotton, or linen fabrics. I love fabrics with unusual features and textures. He said, we used local suppliers for some of the leathers, furs, and the majority of the shoe production, which worked well. But he didn't rule out using some modern techniques like 3D printing, telling me, I use quite a lot of laser cut leather on the costumes, particularly those of Yennefer. Some rubber versions of some of the jewelry of main actors and the findings on Renfrey's stunt armor were 3D printed. And speaking of jewelry, Aslam said, some more individual pieces such as Renfrey's brooch and the jewelry of Taya and Vea I designed and had made in London and Rome respectively. Aslam grouped the various beings in the Witcher world by creating costumes that were specific to each group using common design elements. He said the elves' costumes, for instance, used a special fabric processing technique. We used multi-layer dress sleeves and hard tunics cut similar to a medieval tunic. Their costumes wear off and change the same way because they have to live in harsh conditions and are constantly chased and hunted by humans. One of the biggest challenges for Aslam and his team was Geralt's armor. Aslam used the books as a launching pad for his ideas and studied armor in ancient Eastern civilizations, Roman and medieval times. Actor Henry Cavill, who was very particular about his costume, also had a great deal of input into the design along with his wig and weapon. Aslam told me that there were about six different looks or versions saying some details in the books, such as the spike gloves, were also impossible to recreate for both technical and safety reasons. Now, I personally loved all of Tissaia's dresses, mainly inspired by the late 19th century Gothic revival period, but there was one that stood out above all other costumes worn at the Magical Academy. This amazing trim detail on the back and front bodice of her teal blue gown is inspired by this French ensemble from 1900. The ribbons cross over at the back and pass around the front, creating this sort of corseted appearance. Another one of my personal favorites was Ciri's hooded cloak with the subtle soutache detailing. The blue cloak also gives Ciri a sort of Alice in Wonderland type quality. Aslam said there was an intention to create this look for Ciri to set her slightly apart from everyone else and convey the kind of confused wonder that she experiences during the season to this world that is alien to her. Aslam adds that it has an almost childish fragility and sensitivity. After she escapes, she's left all alone and unaware of what's going on around her. So the cape I designed for Ciri has a certain elegance, but this is not an entirely adult outfit. A monumental undertaking by Wendy Partridge and her team was building about 2,000 costumes and getting them completed on time. She said, One of the challenges was the fact that in the books, the cap does also have to be bulletproof, probably like 1870s Kevlar, maybe not. So I came up with this really delicious thorny print that we printed on all the fabrics before they were embroidered, and that was the Grisha made bulletproofing for our story. In essence, it's sort of like the Wakanda equivalent of a branium. If you zoom in, you can see the printed detail on all of the keftas. According to Partridge, all of the printing was done in India, while the heavy bullion embroidery was hand-stitched. The wardrobe team made 250 individual keftas in all. Partridge said, By far the biggest challenge was the keftas because there were so many of them. And there were so many disciplines and so many clothes and so many different embroiderers, and we had to make them for men and women. Each order of Grisha has its own kefta color, crimson, blue, and purple, with contrasting embroidery. Partridge said, The embroidery took an almost graffiti-esque quality, very gnarly and pointy and modern, and that was very intentional. I don't know that we've ever seen a show with quite so much embroidery in it. The other grouping of costumes that also proved to be intimidating was the First Army uniforms. Partridge said it was a very large undertaking and that there was a lot to manufacture and we wanted the Army to feel like a very intentional mishmash 
We also wanted to make the Army feel like it had been around for a long time, with the uniforms being passed down from generation to generation. And so, rather than just ordering up 500 Army uniforms from some factory, I went about the task of finding every kind of drab color, shade, texture, and weight of material. Sometimes it would just be enough material to make one pair of pants or one jacket. In shadow and bone, the devil is certainly in the details, and you might not have noticed unless you were paying close attention. Partridge said, All of the insignia or ranking, all of that was created for the film, and the buttons were all made, and the buckles were made for the king's emblem. So basically, everything was made from scratch. While the Grisha's costumes get most of the attention, my favorite costume are the late 19th century, almost steampunk-like stylings of the crows, with Jespers being my favorite. Now, this is a tough one because both shows did an amazing job of bringing the costumes to life, but because of all of the complexities and the beautiful details in the costume, the winner for execution goes to Shadow and Bone. The final consideration is the wow factor. A good costume design doesn't necessarily need to have a wow factor to make it great. There are lots of incredible designs that don't have that one or two costumes that cause your jaw to drop. But since the shows are currently tied, it's the wow factor that will determine the winner. While there are so many fantastic costumes to choose from, I have chosen two for The Witcher. The first one is Princess Pavetta's emerald green dress. Costume designer Tim Aslam said, Pavetta's dress had to be special. It was already described as emerald green. The fact that she is defiant of Calanthe's wishes as to whom she marries and then takes center stage when the action kicks off meant she had to be the focal point of the scene. The swirling cut of both the bodice and sleeve heads of the dress were a subtle indication of her powers. The jewelry worn by Pavetta, along with many of the court in Centra, is exquisite. Tim said, I purchased a lot of the jewelry in Turkey from a supplier I had also used in the past on black sales. The other wow factor costume is Yennefer's finale rope dress. Twitter went mad with that outfit. Some loved it and some hated it. Whatever the feeling you might have had for this costume, it had an impact. The costume was inspired by the work of Australian macrame designer Denise M. Vera. Now, while I'm not crazy about how Yennefer's dress was made, I thought it was a very brave costume and it worked well during the final battle scene at Sodden Hill. Let me know what you thought of her rope dress in the comment section below. Shadow and Bone had some standout costumes as well, but likely the costume that packed the biggest wallop was General Kerrigan's costume. I mean, honestly, there is so much going on there. He wears this black leather jacket and black trousers, and worn over that is the daddy of all keftas with black-on-black -black bouillon embroidery, and it's worn open unlike the other Grisha. Ben Barnes would look good in a brown paper bag, but this costume is tailored to perfection on his six-foot frame. According to a Reddit post, the embroidery pattern on his kefta is meant to be shadow tendrils, while the metal fasteners on his underjacket, as well as his ring, show the shadow summoner symbol of an eclipse. His ring reminds me of the one worn by Lestat in Interview with a Vampire, but instead of flesh, Kerrigan cuts through shadows. And then, to just make it all the more awesome, he wears this floor-length cloak trimmed in astrakhan wool with a Jon Snow-style fur collar. In a wonderful juxtaposition to the Darkling's costume is Alina's finale costume. Her sun gold kefta is made of gold silk and it's heavily trimmed with black embroidery. It's essentially her black kefta in reverse. And to accommodate her horns, the neckline is open. This was honestly a really hard decision, but I think that Kerrigan's costume was the showstopper for me. Therefore, the winner for Wow Factor is Shadow and Bone, which means that Shadow and Bone did it better. Let us know in the comment section below who you think did it better, and I have a dedicated Shadow and Bone video planned for the channel, so stay tuned for that. Season 2 of The Witcher is set to drop in December 2021, while Shadow and Bone has been renewed for a second season. Costume designer Wendy Partridge is set to return, and we're looking forward to both shows. And we'll be back with another Who Did It Better? So if you enjoy this content, make sure to subscribe so you don't miss out. 
Thank you for spending time with me. I'll see you in the next video.